Okay, welcome back to the second session, which will be, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take, take your time. The second session will be about long read sequencing. Actually, that's a continuation of uh, the Translate Namse uh, study, which some of you might know. So that was in preparation for getting exomes reimbursed in the um, German healthcare system. And uh, many of the samples that couldn't be uh, diagnosed in, in these cohorts are predestined for advanced uh, sequencing technology and long read sequencing might solve some additional of these samples. So uh, Florian, you are the first. Yeah, thanks a lot for this uh, kind introduction. I will to share my screen. Okay, seems to work. So I hope everyone has a coffee or something sweet. So uh, now more energy to uh, listen to another talk. Um, actually, uh, the talk of uh, Alexander was already a great introduction for what I want to present. So I don't have to go in detail for everything I want to present. And um, yes, uh, first of all, you might already know, but uh, uh, just as a reminder, with short read sequencing, we have some limitations, especially looking at uh, structural variations, looking at low complexity regions, and also uh, like uh, Alexander already showed for the, um, oops, sorry. Um, yes, uh, and also for the repeats. And uh, of course, with short read, it's possible to detect methylation. You can use methyl seq or whole genome bisulfide sequencing. Uh, however, uh, you need uh, two runs for just uh, having the normal information of the DNA and having the methylation. And um, of course, if you want to uh, use long read sequencing in a clinical setup, you have the choice. So you can take the red or the blue pill. So it's actually Oxford Nanopore or PecBio. And uh, these are the two main technologies, but now there's also a glitch in the matrix. So we have Illumina providing also somehow called long read technology. Uh, from my point of view, it's not really comparable to the other technologies. So I won't uh, only uh, comment on the two real long read technologies in the next slide. So if you have a clinical setup, of course, there's not only data quality, which is important because you get a certain uh, you get a certain amount of money reimbursement for your things you do. So you have to also think about cost, scalability, and so on. And I just want to make a quick uh, comparison of the two technologies, what we uh, think or what we discussed uh, are important points. So of course, currently uh, the cost of the device is uh, cheaper for the nanopost sequences and it's the same for maintenance and price per sample which is important because these are costs added all to to the sample so if you get a reimbursement um, it's better to uh, for you to, uh, with, when it's lower another point is scalability so it's scalability is for me um, two things where you can look at the one is um, with oxford nanopore like alexander already present you have to flongle to the promethine flows the same workflow if you want to do a targeted analysis for example for long-range pcr product for a cdna to check for splicing or something like this to the whole genome which is also easier if you want to uh, have an accreditation in the lab and have workflows so you just have one workflow another thing is uh, how many sequences i need to um, analyze um, the samples i have per year and also, we are in Aachen, a rather mid-sized human genetics institute. However, I think we will we would need two to three pack biosequences to uh, do all our samples uh, long read genomes, and we couldn't do this with one um, yeah pack biosequence uh, with one nanopore sequencer currently. Um, I think the input amount yeah it's currently a little bit lower for nanopore, but I see there's also some. Um, uh, protocols for low input for PEC bio coming next and the workflow from the lab is I think comparable so there are no difference and one important point of course is the accuracy of the data because you want to be able to really find all the mutations and here uh, actually um, the accuracy is higher for PEC bio which is shown a lot of papers 
um, especially looking at uh, the indels and homopolymers. However, looking at uh, um, small, uh, so at uh, point mutations or structural variations or methylation changes, I think the technologies are comparable to Illumina. So therefore, or PEC Bio performed also slightly better to Illumina. So depending on what you look at, perhaps uh, this, um, yeah, minor uh, reduction accuracy is maybe not important. So I want to now shortly introduce the uh, Longer Consortia. So it's a national uh, initiative in Germany um, from um, yeah to uh, evaluate uh, the use of long read sequencing in a clinical setup. So uh, the sequencing, uh, there are currently four, or in the beginning it was four, now there are five sequencing centers involved. So Mainz is already joining and we are open also for other ones who wants to join the project because we believe more data and more experience with the technology lead up uh, in a better, yeah, um, wet lead and bioinformatic pipelines and can really be helpful to uh, make a successful pro project in the end. And luckily, ONT was uh, um, funded us uh, with a thousand samples we have in the next two years and could sequence uh, during this project. And we have three aims. So we want to demonstrate the added diagnostic value and that you can use this in the, um, uh, uh, the long read sequencing in a clinical setup. For the, all the index cases we sequence, we have all, uh, also short read data available. So we can really make a, a benchmarking. Do we uh, see all the important variants? Do we miss some pathogenic variants compared to the short read sequencing? And I think this will be an important point to show that uh, in the end, the technology performs equal to Illumina and uh, maybe for, uh, or with maybe for um, structural variants, methylation also better. And to, um, yeah, to help other laboratories to implement these technologies, we want to provide SOPs for the bed, wet lab. So what is the best robust workflow to get uh, good data out of your sample and also have a bioinformatic pipeline addressing all the uh, clinical important, um, yeah, variations you want to uh, address in the clinical setup. So uh, this is the set, uh, how the project works. So we started in beginning this year with a pilot. So we had 20 samples per site, which are currently um, uh, comp uh, which are currently uh, used for a first uh, initial study to show the feasibility using this technology. In the first year, it's more the aim to collect data because we still haven't a freely available database with, for example, the structural variations uh, found by long read sequencing. So we don't have population frequencies. So it's very hard to filter if a variant is pathogenic or not. So the first year is more data collection, optimize the wet lab workflow and bioinformatic pipelines. And in the second year, when we have all this in place, we want to use it in a normal routine setup. So meaning that we have um, yeah, from the sample coming to the lab to the clinical findings around six, uh, six to eight weeks uh, turnaround time. It could be challenging, but we are, um, yeah, uh, we are optimistic that uh, this could be um, achieved. Okay, so the question is a little bit my talk, is it time to move on to long read sequencing? And um, I hope I can uh, convince you in this talk that it's perhaps time to do this. So first of all, I want to start with uh, some parameters we use. So of course, long read sequencing can sequence up to several hundred, hundred KB long DNA molecules, but this is not suitable for a routine setup. So what we uh, decided for the pilot, we having around 15 KB uh, library size um, because there are samples coming from automated DNA isolation solutions or from manual handling or from other sites. And sometimes there are really um, um, small fragments inside, so you couldn't um, sequence very long uh, molecules. So 15KB was uh, yeah, the sweet spot for that to having, uh, um, yeah, to sequence all the samples uh, coming uh, into the study. And you can see here the uh, library size distribution oh, um, around, uh, which is uh, under three sites around, um, yeah, 15 KB. And another thing is what we uh, thought, so we want to have at least uh, 35x genomic coverage to really have enough coverage in all the regions we have to analyze for, um, uh, yeah, for the uh, for the patients to having uh, in all the important regions which are associated with diseases enough coverage. 
And actually what we get is around, uh, yeah, overall centers around 120 gigabases per flow cell, which is pretty good, meaning we have at least 40 X genomic coverage. Uh, we have some samples where more, we have more 50 X genomic coverage, but in the end, this works pretty well. Okay, and um, now I want to start with some yeah examples uh, we had uh, in our initial pilot study in our cohort. And the first patient or example I want to show is a patient which has a uh, sensory, uh, sensory polyneuropathy and a chronic cord. So maybe a lot of people here now know what's uh, the disease behind this, but um, it's a patient where it's actually, where, where, which actually caused by uh, uh, canvas, uh, so a cerebellar ataxia, neuropathy, vestibular areflexia syndrome. <laughs> and uh, these are the uh, important uh, symptoms in this case. And uh, you might know that this symptom is caused by a repeat expansion. So it's the RFC1 gene, and there is a repeat in the exon 2 of this gene. And um, it's a little bit difficult because there could be different motives in the repeat. So we have uh, the, yeah, let's say wild type one where we have a 4A G motive. And this is a uh, repeat is very short in, uh, in most of the people of the population. We could also have an 3A G motive, which is also benign. Uh, also these motives do uh, two ones can be expanded, but still uh, benign. And we have a motive of only two A's and three G's, uh, which uh, could be expanded and then it's pathogenic. Um, so uh, if you have a patient in the lab, you have to find somewhere with some methods out if there is a repeat expansion. And the first step, what you do in the routine setup is um, you make a PCR because if there's just this uh, short uh, repeat inside, you get uh, a PCR product. You can see this here in for sample one and sample four. So we have a PCR product, meaning the patient has an, the Y type allele. Then we have in lane three, we could see here, uh, maybe uh, <laughs> hardly visible, but uh, there's a larger band. So indicating there could be a repeat expansion, but perhaps not that long. And here in the second slot, which seems to be empty, uh, there's no uh, PCR product vis visible, um, indicating there could be a very large repeat expansion. And for this too, of course, then you have to check uh, if there is a repeat expansion and if there is an expansion, which motive the expansion has. And what you use for this is a triple prime PCR for these three um, um, yeah, motor, uh, repeat motives you have. And the results look a little bit like this. So we have a healthy one here, a healthy sample here. And uh, you can see it looks normal. We have one peak at the beginning. And then we have here on the other side, uh, a patient with having this canvas. And you can see also for the two upper motifs, we couldn't see repeat expansion. However, for the uh, um, yeah, pathogenic uh, uh, repeat motif, you can see there are some these spike uh, spikes and this meaning there's a repeat expansion. You couldn't exactly measure with this method how long the repeat are, but you know there is some uh, repeat expansion. And you can also try to apply for this patient's whole genome sequencing because whole genome sequencing is also with short read, uh, pos it's possible to somehow identify repeat motives or repeat expansions. And this is what we do. So we do Illumina short read sequencing. And uh, there are some tools uh, which called Expansion Hunter implemented in our case in the Dragon Pipeline from Illumina, uh, which then used the reads, uh, which you can see here, together with unmapped reads to somehow estimate repeat size. And this was in this case around 70 repeats. And you can, you can see on this side, so the gray parts of the reads, so the uh, gray horizontal bars are um, this one fitting to the reference genome. And the colorful parts where you can see the single bases don't fit to reference genome. And uh, you can also, also see here that we have the pathogenic repeat motive. So we have only two A's and three G's, whereas the reference is four A's and one G. However, uh, so normally patients having this disease having more than 300 repeats of the motive. So when we check with long read, it looks a little bit different. Um, we have also this colorful reads here, meaning we don't have spent the, the whole repeat. However, we have also this purple bars here with uh, 2,700 and 4,000 
something um, which showing an insertion. So we have an insertion in this place because we have a repeat expansion. And when we looked here, we can for both alleles measure the repeat length. And this is actually to, uh, 500 and 900 repeats. So a little bit higher than the 70 repeats estimated by short read. And um, we have also in our cohort some other patients, one having this CSTB repeat. Here again, um, um, the short read estimates around eight, uh, uh, 28 repeats. However, in the end, it was for 50. So we covered the whole repeat and see it's 50 uh, repeat motifs inside. For FGF14, it's a little bit different because the short read is, uh, sequencing told us we have 200 and 300, but actually we have 150 and 250 uh, repeats. So meaning that the estimation made by Expansion Hunter is something it could be larger it could be um could be smaller the repeat perhaps it's an indication but it's not more so if you really want to analyze a repeat expansion i think long read is the only option um then i have a second example you may know uh, sm11 is a gene which is difficult uh, to uh, sequence because uh, um we have an, um, yeah tandem duplication somehow in our evolution. So this part of the genome, oh, that's difficult to show. Okay. Uh, the one part of the uh, genome is amplified. So we have now um, all of these genes the second time in the genome with only minor changes. So it's really hard with short read sequencing or nearly impossible to discriminate if the reads you get coming from SN1 or 2. <laughs> And what you normally do in the lab is one, uh, one uh, an MLPA to see if there are copy number variations, and then you do some Sanger sequencing or NGS to see if there are some um, mutations inside. But you will only get uh, the mutations um, where you can say they are uh, in the genome, but you never know if they belong, or for most of them, you never know if they belong to SMN1 or SMN2, and therefore diagnostic is really difficult. And uh, I want to show you the mapping results. So if you just use short read, you can see here, this is whole genome sequencing, but it looks like exome sequencing because <laughs> we just have this peaks here. And this is, um, we have a lot of reads in this areas, but they are colored white because the mapping quality is zero, meaning the read maps with the same, same alignment score at different points of the genome, in this case at SM1 and SM2. And therefore you couldn't decide to which uh, gene they belong. And if you have variation inside in the reads, you never know if the mutation is an SM1 or SM2. And using long read, of course, this is a little bit easier. It's still not perfect, but it's more a bioinformatical problem and not uh, a problem of the sequencing technology. Um, so we can see that we cover most of the genes, only exome one is missing. But if we um, um, make better bioinformatic approaches using the um, SNPs we have in the first part or in, uh, here um, in uh, our reads, we can also face more reads for the exon one, so then the full gene will be covered. But this is still, like I said, the bioinformatic pipelines are still we op still optimizing them, so um, they are not perfect. However, also with uh, this current status of the alignment, I want to show you one example where we have a patient which having two uh, mutations uh, in SMN1 or SMN2. Uh, and they are uh, both pathogenic, and then you have to des uh, decide in which gene they are, in which gene they localized, and if they are on the same allele or on uh, two different alleles. And this is what we tried. So we have the mutation here. This is uh, the red one. We can see, OK, on this reads where this mutation is, there's no mutation on this allele, but we have this mutation, the second mutation here, where not uh, no mutation on this allele. So we know they are lying on different alleles and therefore um, that they have a compound heterozygous mutation, SM1, which could cause the disease. And this was not possible before with the normal yeah, techniques. Um, yeah, good, I could skip this. Um, another uh, example where uh, long read sequencing uh, is helpful is perhaps in printing, um, because you get the methylation information together with the uh, DNA sequence and it comes for free. So as long as you do no amplification before you, you get the uh, um, methylation information in, um, you, uh, uh, yeah, independent of what you do. 
And um, I want to shortly introduce you to imprinting uh, disorders or what is imprinting. So imprinting is basically a parent of origin specific methylation of genes, meaning if your gene comes from uh, the mother, it's perhaps methylated and the same gene comes from the father, it's unmethylated, but it could be also the other way around. So meaning that uh, in the end, only one uh, gene, uh, one allele is active and the other one is silenced. And uh, if this disturb, so both alleles are active or both alleles are silenced, this could uh, lead to uh, specific disorders like already explained Prada, Prada willi syndrome or Angelman syndrome, but also back with Wiedemann, Silver Russell, and there's some more imprinting uh, related disorders uh, already known. And there are different mechanisms how this could be, uh, how this could happen. Of course, uh, it could be that you have in the active allele, for example, a lesion or a point mutation leading to the loss of the function of the uh, of the gene, and therefore it's the same like it's silent, so it's lost, then um, you will see some phenotype. Another thing which is possi possible is called uniparental disomy, meaning you have uh, um, allele, or uh, you have both alleles from the mother or the father. And one thing which is uh, important for us because it occurs very often in uh, back with Wiedemann or Silver Russell syndrome are the um, epimutations. So meaning that just the methylation is changed and not the DNA itself, which leading to a, a higher or lower expression. And I have one example here where we have a patient with overgrowth, uh, hemihypertrophy and macroclosia. And um, these are indications for Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. And what you uh, do in the PC uh, in the lab to analyze this is um, um, methylation-specific MLPA, which gives you information about the methylation status of just a single CPG at different sites of the genome, and uh, 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 and for the copy number. Of course, if you see some copy number alterations, maybe you do an array afterwards to better see how big the deletion or amplification is, or you can also do NGS to, to see this. And um, yes, so uh, with this patient, uh, we can see here in the copy number plot in the upper part, um, maybe some, some guys are here used to the, um, MRC Holland plots, you can see uh, that the dots are all uh, in the middle, so meaning there's no copy number change. However, when we looked at the lower uh, plot, you can see that there are uh, some dots below this uh, red line, so meaning there's a loss of methylation. And we want to check if we can saw this loss of methylation really in our long read data. And um, we have here these two losses in methylation in the KCNQ1 loci, uh, the one here. And we can see we have our patient here in the upper part and we have on a control in the lower part. In the lower part, we have a 50-50 distribution between methylated and unmethylated alleles. And in the upper part, you can see all of them or most of them are unmethylated. So fitting to the results we see here and the same is true for the other probe, um, which is used. So we have again, a loss of methylation. And uh, now we can also go to the other part. So here can you uh, here can that the loss of methylation is not as strong as uh, shown for the other two sites. And we can also see this in our long read data because uh, we see actually compared to the results before where we only have the blue bases. So sees um, without methylation, we have here now a mix between methylated and unmethylated bases. And in control again, it's a 50-50 distribution. Um, however, when we looked at the whole low size, so these are the uh, two positions we looked before, we can see uh, that uh, over the whole low size, we can see this 50-50 uh, distribution in the um, control sample, but here in the upper part, we see a loss of methylation, which is in some areas here also stronger than in the area was checked by the MLPA. So if you have an... Um, yeah, and loss of methylation, which is on the edge, perhaps helps to really look at the whole loci. And even uh, these diseases are often occur in a mosaic state. So having a single read and seeing that all the uh, bases are methylated or unmethylated can also help to anti uh, identify um, yeah, mosaic systems um, and make a di uh, better yeah, diagnostics on, on this. 
Okay, uh, and I, we looked also on, a, on another low cell, which seems to be not affected, the Blagel one, and you can see in the patient and in the control, we can see a 50-50 distribution. So it's uh, for all of the results, uh, it fits to the uh, MLPA analysis. Okay, so um, yeah, coming to sum up the talk, um, from my point of view, I think, uh, um, yeah, long read sequencing could be easily implemented uh, as routine in a routine lab using uh, still um, uh, short read sequencing because we didn't, uh, didn't adjust as much for our workflow. So we basically used the devices we used instead of the sequencer, but uh, we used in our normal uh, analysis. Uh, the data is reliable and the data quality is good so far. So we can look at repeat expansions, also at single and point mutations and methylation uh, comes for free, which could be also important for other diseases like Cornelia de Lange or Krebstra syndrome, showing some AP, AP signatures where you look in the genome what uh, is changed. So from my point of view, it's time to uh, move on to long read sequencing in the clinical setups. I have to thank some people, at least my PI, Ingo and Sebastian, who do all the wet lab work for the Aachen part, and the PIs of the other uh, sites for the longer project, Tobias, Stefan, Nadja, and Bernd, the ONT guys, and also from um, we have some support from NVIDIA. And yeah, then I thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks a lot. Really impressive data. Uh, Blick diagnosen with imprinting disorders. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the audience? Then I start with one. Um, can you comment a little bit on the computational costs of the analysis? Um, yeah, so there were some improvements this year so that you can do uh, all the base calling during the run on the Promethein device itself, so which was before a problem because you need a lot of GPU power to do this. And then you have a normal uh, pipeline because starting from BAM files. So I think it's comparable then to the uh, to the short read analysis from the CPU time and memory and what you need for the analysis. So this, I think now with the newer base caller and the uh, uh, newer Promethein towers, which do this uh, in uh, live base calling, I think it's pretty good. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Dresden. After computation, it costs wet lab costs in terms of um, is there a lot of work need to be done to align uh, different sites or is it actually um, kind of agnostic to different preparation methods to get to kind of the same data output in terms of also quality, not only amount, but quality as well? Yeah, this is actually one target of the consortia to see which DNA expression methods are useful, uh, are su suitable for with long read sequencing and which not. From our first experience, I would say 90% of the extraction methods works really well. Um, you can already see that there's some difference uh, regarding the output in the different sites, but I think we can uh, yeah, align something that we can uh, just make better. We also make this, so we have bi-weekly meetings uh, to discuss this. And then I think when we have these uh, yeah, wet lab SOPs, I think it should be pretty easy for other labs when they follow these SOPs really carefully uh, to get also nice uh, data out of the uh, yeah, of, uh, nanopore uh, libraries. Thomas, you had a question. Short question. Are there performance data with genome in a bottle? I guess there are. However, I don't know it, so I wish to ask. So, uh, yeah, towards there are a lot of studies already published with genome in a bottle samples. They look very great, but uh, we have a talk uh, after my talk. Stefan will present more bioinformatic data. Uh, and uh, we have included in our pilot study genome in a bottle samples, and he will show how the uh, uh, Oxford nanopore sequencing performs. Okay, thank you. That's a great uh, Überleitung. Yeah. Oh, a uh, question. Okay. So DNA is in a great way, but what do you think about full-length RNA sequencing? Uh, do you use that? Is that also close to diagnostics, or um, is it? What's your so experience? when you're speaking really on RNA sequencing, I would say 
maybe not because it's hard for us to preserve the DNA in full length in our blood samples. And uh, I think the workflow is still challenging. If you if you're talking about a uh, whole uh, full length cDNA sequencing, I think this uh, uh, could be really already used. But if you really go to uh, RNA sequencing, um, no, <laughs> from my point of view. <laughs> yeah. Any questions from the online audience? Okay, then we continue with Stefan. He will present the data from the Tübingen longer side. Maybe I ask another question in the meantime, um, Florian, what, what do you think um, is the cohort size that you need to identify artifacts that are specific for um, nanopore? Where's Florian? <laughs> Yeah, good question, but hard to answer. But uh, I believe something around ten uh, thousand samples could be could be a beginning, but having around ten thousand samples would be great. So this is actually one thing we try to connect to other international projects doing or national projects doing nanopore sequencing on a larger scale to have at least a database with ten thousand samples for population frequencies and so on. And I think. There we can also filter artifacts, but we can also begin with the uh, samples because the no, genome no, and no, no. samples are sequenced with PEG bio nanopore, and uh, we can perhaps filter out with this uh, data sets already some of the artifacts. Yeah, thanks. That looks great. We are there. <laughs> Very good. Sorry. Okay, it's there. No, oh, good. So I don't need this here. No, no, no. Just start. <laughs> Good, I'm sorry for the delay somehow. We missed my talk. So um, as said before, and I had two great speakers before me, which helped me a lot to introduce a lot of topics, which I can jump now because I have too many slides anyway. And I will focus mostly on bringing the long reads into rare disease diagnostics. And I mean, really in routine diagnostics. And I think there are two, for me personally, two main things to solve. One is accreditation 
accreditation with the DACs, meaning to have a laboratory developed test and to show that it is robust enough to be used in diagnostics. And the second is that you have robust software, which allows actually to use this test. So first of all, your typical rare disease analysis, you have your uh, family, you have your samples, you have sequenced them and you have sort of a pipeline. So wet lab, then you have an AGS analysis pipeline and finally you have a clinical decision support system, which takes this pipeline, uh, this data from the pipeline and presents it in a way that is understandable for geneticists, for clinicians in a short amount of time. And ours is called GS1. And um, we have to bring that to long reads. Uh, we have done that for probably uh, 12, 13 years now for short reads. These systems are well understood and we know the biases we know the best tools. We have loads of benchmarked papers. For long reads, we don't have that yet. And for long reads, we have new things that we can actually integrate. So we don't have only long read alignment based and consensus based variants, but we can also in theory now go to telomere to telomere genome assembly and work with assemblies instead of alignments. And we can integrate direct, direct methylation, methylation measures. measures. So, so all, all of that, that needs to be used uh, here um, kind of a view on how this could look like in the future when instead of having these alignments where in IGV you see these hundreds of reads or cluttered and ugly and instead you do a genome de novo assembly and face your assembly into two haplotypes then you have just one line for each person you have sequence and if you have a family a mother and a father you can see perfectly here in this insert that both daughters inherited the allele with the insert from mother and father. You can actually do compound heterozygotes without sequencing a trio. You can see it in a single patient. So that would be much easier to handle than these uh, big read alignment pictures you often see from IGV. So that's, that's the big goal. Obviously we had to start with the computational analysis. We have to implement the pipeline part, the middle part I showed before, we had to, to, to uh, test a lot of different tools. We didn't program all these tools ourselves, but what we had to do is to benchmark them, which are the best tools. There are often multiple tools available and then how to put them together so that you get a robust result and add after every step uh, quality control so that your results are really reliable and robust and reproducible. And when we were finished, we looked at the W uh, what was the WF human variation pipeline? And we realized we came almost to the same result. So that's good. It seems like there are a set of tools which are really well made for these long reads, like for instance, deep variant or um, what everyone is using or minimap for alignment and so on. So that's having that included. The next step is to also enable your clinical decision support system to actually utilize it. As we have heard, for instance, repeat expansion work much better. So you want to improve their visualization. You now have to add potentially methylation if you didn't have it. So in our system, you can see we have a lot of buttons up here, which do a lot of things like um, phenotypic matching and um, uh, copy number variants, structure variants, repeat expansions, and so on. And so on. All of that now needs to be set up for working with long read results. And well, we want to be agnostic to the technology. So PacBio and NanoPore should both be supported. That's what we had to do first. And we are pretty much finished with some exceptions. Um, the RNA-seq long read is not fully in there. And finally, you also want to generate reports that reflect your new and better knowledge, hopefully from long reads, including like something like imprinting we heard before and so on. So you have seen that picture multiple times now. Uh, if you look exactly on the map, you see that I don't have uh, mines yet because they joined newly and I didn't update the figure. And Florian did update it. But um, again, just to say that our goal is to test in total 1,000 samples in clinical diagnostics to show that it's feasible, that we can do it robustly, and also that it's financially feasible and so on. Um, with all the personnel 
Important for this talk is only just the first 80, because the first 80 we did, we can use now for benchmarking. And in these 80, we included genome in a bottle um, reference samples, HG001 and 002. Every participant sequence them deeply so we can even compare the quality between different labs. Um, so we, I will mostly focus in my talk on that part here, analysis and quality control in that analysis step, not so much on the rest. Okay, so genome in a bottle. Um, we used the two most commonly used cell lines, HG001 and 002. You might know these instead of names like NA12878 or so on. Um, these uh, are really used in many, many benchmark tests. We, for instance, use these samples also to accredit our short read based whole genome diagnostic. Um, we also did the AT patients, but um, I We'll go to that later. And as already Florian showed, we try to select from each side these 20 patients based on very hard to solve cases. So repeat expansions, we already heard, low complexity regions with lots of repeats and so on, pseudogenes, we heard one example already, um, pathogenic haplotypes like in OPN1 cluster for eye disease and imprinting. And well, we, we had quite a lot of overlap, so we seem to consider similar things hard to solve. So you will see some redundancy in the slides. I'm sorry for that. One, some remarks we heard before that average read depth, we do actually try to get beyond 38x. And that is mostly also because of that statistics, which is our so-called gap statistic. A gap statistic means when we drop below 20x, we consider that site not callable anymore for diagnostic purpose. And we want to minimize these gaps. And we can see that the higher the coverage, the closer we get to zero gaps, so to 100% coverage with or sites with more than 20x. Very important. Uh, read depth, we think 38x is the golden point. Computational analysis was something that was asked. We on average need between 20 and 30 hours until everything has been analyzed um, fully. We could do it faster, but because we do a lot in parallel, that's the average time, 26 hours. And the other statistics are not that interesting. We also see that we get these 120 uh, gigabases and these runs normally look like that. They have a slow decline in open in useful pores on the machine, and then you can top up. And when it doesn't work well, then it looks like very quick decline. And we found that, that then even top up doesn't help, uh, just as a hint. And that's kind of what we try to achieve, 120 gig. So genome in a bottle is a big consortium. They sequenced a few cell lines to extreme depth with like a lot of different sequencing technologies and created two benchmark sets, one for high confidence regions. That's about 70% of the genome that you can reliably call with short reads. And they are mostly used for uh, benchmarking and for accreditation. And then they created a new benchmark set for difficult regions. That's the other 30%, which are really hard to assess with short reads. And here the real difference is show uh, between the technologies. To create that data set, especially the hard to assess regions, uh, they had to use uh, from ParkBio to Nanopore to BioNano and other technologies like even high c chromatin folding and so on. And the uh, similar technology that is used for creating the telomere to telomere assemblies. So using these, we could now assess our um, precision and recall for different coverages. So we could take our deep coverage we created up to 60x on each side and then subsample and see how it improves. And you can see that for SNFs between 20 and 30x, we reach the 99.9 accuracy. So 30x, which is kind of similar to short reads, is enough to reach very high accuracy for SNVs. Um, for indels, it's always a bit harder. And that's genome wide here, where the position is a bit lower than encoding. And you can see that even 
at 60x coverage, we still see improvements and we are not yet where we want to be for accreditation. Uh, for the other sample, it looks very similar. Um, the absolute optimum might be a bit lower. I don't know why that is actually. And then you can also see that there are different tools we can compare and choose the best. Um, I think I jump over that and go directly to that comparison. We heard before that one could uh, focus maybe on coding instead of whole genome. Um, most of the known disease causing short indels we probably expect in coding. So you can see here that for SNFs, it doesn't matter if we look whole genome or in coding or almost doesn't matter. The difference is negligible. But for indels, it does make a difference. We get a significantly better recall. And we also saw that we are a bit lower here than the numbers that ONG gave us. And we think it's because this data was done before the release of Dorado. And now the new base caller might bring us to these 95%, which would be enough for us to go to accreditation. Precision is already in the green for us. So that's one result. The other result is that for indels, the coverage increase is still up to 40, 50, even 50x, we see improvements. So that means uh, we can still do something there by just packing more coverage, but I will show later that maybe the duplex suites are the thing to go for. For SNFs, 30x is more than enough. So what can we do? Duplex suites, we already saw that slide, so it's just, from the company's website, it's supposed to go from uh, the old pore to the new pore and now to the duplex reads from a lot of errors to almost nothing. So that's great. It sounded really good. We wanted to get that. So we tried uh, the duplex reads in our genome in a bottle samples. The first thing we realized, if we look over the length of the reads and check the quality, we see that in the normal reads, it's slowly declining. You might know that from Illumina, they also slowly decline in quality over the reads. And we see actually a similar effect for nanopore. If we do duplex reads, that's not the case. It seems like always stable. And why? If you sequence the forward and reverse trend from two sides, you have high quality on both sides. So you get longer pieces of high quality. And that actually shows when you see here in the very low, lowest measure with the simplex reads, Minimap clips off almost every read at some point and says, ah, I don't like it from here on, I don't use it. With the duplex reads, it only clips off 12%. So almost 90% of the reads are aligned full length. That's, that's great. That's also probably great for the transcriptome sequencing for the RNA. And then the other results are quite of what we expected. We significantly by about fivefold reduced the number of uh, gap errors and that is going in the right direction. So with, if we would have enough duplex reads, we heard that the yield still has to improve. Uh, we would be also for indels at the Illumina level. So now some examples, I will go very quickly through these examples. Um, because we lost a bit of time before and we saw them already. One that is very obvious is structural variance. Here, a typical deletion. You can see that you can get these deletions with the Lumina if the regions around it are not too repetitive. Unfortunately, many deletions happen in repetitive context, but then you see these clip reads. But with nanopore, you get this thin line over it. So basically, the that shows the read spans the deletion and you get perfect breakpoints. And here's for comparison, Bionado, another um, technology, not sequencing based. Okay, so how is there the quality? It's very good. Here we compare two tools, QDSV and Sniffles. Here you see the coverage. So you can see at beyond 20X, they are at the very high uh, precision and Recall, you can see that cute as we outperform sniffles slightly when you have extremely high coverage, 50X, we get an optimum at close to 95% recall at 94 precision. But at lower coverage, um, 
cute as we sucks, I would say, uh, you should take sniffles. So if you have less than 40x, our opinion is sniffles is better. And at very high coverage, the difference is marginal. So we decided to continue with uh, sniffles here and looking at this, I would suggest to have at least 30x and 40x, something in between. Again, as I said, our gold standard is 38. That's kind of the best. In fact, when we went higher coverage, we got a few more false positives. So probably more than 40x is not necessary. And as you can see, that's, these are really good results. I don't show the Illumina results here, but Illumina has a recall of less than 50% for structure variants. So you will see twice as many structure variants in the genome than with Illumina, which is a challenge for your clinical decision support system for sure, but it's nice to know that you are close to 100% recall. Okay, and now some other examples that we have already seen. I will just mention compound heterozygotes we can now get without a trio because we can face the two haplotypes and we can perfectly see if the variants are on one or on two uh, alleles. Structure variants I just showed, we get about twice as many as these as the uh, short reads. And now I have some quick examples which are very similar to Florian's examples. Repeat expansions, you obviously want to use the haplotype phasing to phase into the short and the long repeat. If it's a heterozygous for homozygous, you will just get the same repeat expansion length. And then you can see that you have a short and a long repeat and make the average here for getting the exact ex expansion. Here's one, a CAG. In Huntington's disease, we can clearly see it. There's two alleles. Um, very easy in IGV, and uh, this one is not yet haplotype phase, um, so it's not sorted uh, fully, but it's even without phasing well to see. So 53 extra repeats. Here is uh, an ataxia case in uh, spinocerebellar ataxia type 3. Here we have a, a CAG repeat, it's also a clear Discrepancy, both alleles are longer, but only that one is has a pathogenic length. Then we have FGF14 here. I show that because that was the latest new repeat to be discovered in ataxia and is still interesting to people. And it's pretty well to see that in one allele, we actually had less than expected. And in the other, we had here quite a bit, 750 extra. So. 300 extra repeats. As you can see, the measurements are not always perfect. Due to misalignment, sometimes one read predicts a bit less, but if you take the distribution and the peak, you are quite on, on spot. Okay, and then we have the very complicated ones. So this one here, a G4C2 hexanucleotide repeat is around 10 KB. That's challenging because as you heard before, we only did a read length of 15 KB on average. So in that one, we got only two reads that fully spanned these 10 KB. We still could call it, but most of the reads were actually clipped off at the repeat end. I mean, you can see there is something clipped here and then you have these two spanning, but there's tight maybe here, 20 KB read average would have been better. We would have more reads spanning our repeat expansion. What's also very interesting, is that haplotype phasing uh, made me realize how different alleles can be. So here's one example, and I will come back to this one soon. Here's a repeat expansion. Here is the normal length. But when you look at the complete haplotype, it's shocking that there's almost no SNFs here, and it's full of SNFs here. And I've never seen that before when you just have chaotic reads. Um, alleles can be massively different, um, not just in one position, but in, in hundreds of positions in a very small region. We heard about methylation here, not, not a tool of my group, but very nice tool. It plots very nicely the haplotype phase methylation and then the two alleles where one on an imprinting locus where one is methylated and one is not. And here, if you have a UPD or something, you expect a problem. Um, my example here is, yeah, I think I have two. SNRPN is the first one, and here the deletion in our case leads to 
a single unmethylated allele. Normally in healthy, you have a mix. You have a, a one methylated, one non-methylated. In our patient, we have only unmethylated, but this is not the original cause of the disease, but a deletion that simply deleted the methylated allele causing the disease. So that's just basically a side effect of the actual causal pathogenic mutation. Um, here in Fragile X syndrome, we had this example before. So uh, we found one case here where, again, these expansion on the X chromosome leads to hypermethylation. And in that case, the hypermethylation is what silences the allele and is the actual pathogenic effect. While in the control, we have much less methylation, mostly blue. Blue in that case is no methylation IgV and red is methylated. So yeah, well, you probably all know the FMR1 and Fragile X, so I don't have to explain it. And the last example we have also heard before, SMN1 is one of the most famous. Duplicate genes with a pseudogene copy, but other than Florian, who had found a point mutation, in our case, it was a large deletion. And with short reads, we could never have called that because there would be a lot of short reads mapping in there, all with mapping quality zero in the whole gene. So you cannot distinguish between a real deletion and just mapping quality zero. But here with these long reads that map with high quality, you can be sure that there's really nothing there and we have a deletion. We're still trying to figure out why we have no spanning reads. We guess it's because the whole region is so repetitive, but we are not fully sure. Okay, so in the last five minutes, I want to show our latest discovery um, that all started with a large family from Utah, from Stefan Pulst, and he discussed this family with Olaf Ries and told him that for 25 years, they tried to solve that case of spinocerebellar ataxia 4. Uh, they have kind of a linkage on chromosome 16Q, but still don't know the causal gene. It's highly repetitive locus and it's, it's a mess. And they have this huge Mormon family, which originates from Sweden. And many people, it's dominant, so they have a lot of uh, affected people. And they can track, because the Mormons have these books where they track back their ancestry to generations. We have like a sixth generation family. So we chose six of them. And Olaf said, why not just uh, throw everything we have on it? Pack bio, nanopore, short reads, whatever we have and see what happens. To be less biased, I show now Pug bio results. I talked a lot about nanopore already. And the great tool target, uh, it's uh, really one of the best repeat expansion analysis tools uh, produced by Pug bio immediately showed us one gene, the gene set FHX3, has a repeat expansion previously unknown. And it's, it's a dominant disease, so it's a uh, heterozygous, and here are three of the six. Uh, the picture actually has six, but it didn't fit here. So we could identify the repeat expansion. We could then check, and the um, pathogenic repeat starts around 42, 43, and that's the rest of distribution of other non-pathogenic um, cases. We also validated by PCR. That was very complicated in the end. Uh, Carla there from Utah only managed to amplify it on cDNA level, not on DNA. This repeat seems to not like PCR. It also doesn't like exome sequencing. You cannot see it in exomes, we found out, probably because exomes have to be amplified the DNA before. Now, phasing again, we can haplotype phase. And the interesting thing was that Tobias Haag, uh, one of our Oberärzte, uh, he discussed uh, these repeat expansions with Malte Spielmann, and they found out that in Lübeck, they identified the same repeat expansion independently in two cases. And they also did long read Pug bio. So we got their data like two months ago, and I compared these haplotypes. I took one from Utah as a baseline, the red one, and checked, and they all have a pretty much one megabase haplotype, which seems to be this original haplotype from Sweden, where this Utah family came from. Unfortunately, checking in Gnoma, this haplotype is mega frequent in Northern Europe. It's pretty much close to fixation in some parts. So the repeat expansion you see here happened in a very common Northern Scandinavian haplotype. 
So that doesn't really help us to identify more cases. So what we did then is uh, we started with Expansion Hunter and used that specific loci we found in our short read data, about 6,500 genomes. I remember about 600 of them have ataxia. And we found five additional cases in our tubing database, all of them having the repeat at the same position. And now we could compare all of them and look for very rare unique SNFs for this repeat that are flanking the repeat. And we found six SNFs, which are all ultra rare. This one actually is completely absent from GNOMAD. The others are, are like one in 10,000 and which are absent from our unaffected family members from Utah. And using these six SNFs, we could uh, then find another two cases which Expansion Hunter for some reason missed. We don't know why in IGV you can see the expansion. So in total, we are arriving at 15. We already know that other people found in Sweden um, more cases of that. So it seems like not too rare, but we think it's an old founder mutation. So they all go back to like a 250 year old founder mutation because they all share at least five of these flanking rare SNFs. And this SNF is specifically interesting because it must have happened later in the Northern branch of this huge pedigree. So it's only found in Utah and Lübeck, but not in middle and Southern Germany. So interesting, overall interesting repeat. Using these two SNFs, we can now genotype people with PCR and Sanger because they are unique to that specific uh, repeat. And uh, that makes it much quicker to just check people. Okay, uh, with that, these are the people who were participating in this last study, we just submitted to Med Archive. So that's the paper, but it's unfortunately not online yet. Here again, all the longer team, which has already been shown. So I don't read it again. And the photo of longer. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's impressive how some discoveries are really in the air so that multiple people detected at the same time. I think once you have the right technology, in that yeah. case, long reads, it suddenly works yeah. because we checked. I think the reason it was not found before was that in exomes, you don't get this amplified mm -hmm. and it's simply a drop of coverage in exomes. I think the allele is not there, mm -hmm. although it's coding, but you don't see it yeah. in exomes. It's just the technology. And in short reads, as you have seen, you have a Good chance to find it, but not 100%. Mm, um, yeah. Was five out of seven we could detect with expansion hardware. Great. Do we have questions from the audience? Uh, quite a couple. So let's start with you, Tom. Thank you, Stefan. You showed exactly the data I have been asking for. <laughs> However, not quite so. Oh. A, <laughs> there is a pinch of salt. It appears that there is a problem with the statistics. And so I feel compelled to make a short comment, if you if you don't mind. It yeah. may well be that in a particular experiment with a particular sample, you observe n successes in n trials. So the estimator of, uh, say, sensitivity or specificity, whatever, is unity. However, that quantity is a sample estimator. We are not interested in the sample estimator. We should know the parameter estimator, which is quite a different thing, particularly in the case of zero and unity. So confidence limits may help. And you could, could greatly, greatly enhance your data. You have got the data if you would show them. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, very good point. Um, as I said before, we looked at only one data set here now. We have them four times. Hopefully soon even more participants will sequence these samples. And maybe that can help to get kind of better confidence. Uh, the subsampling is a, is a way in that direction as well. But uh, yeah, no, we can we can improve the statistics. As I said, our values are not 100% matching with the one from the company. So yes, there is definitely ways for improvement, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, two questions. So first technical um, reference genome, did you try T to T and 
thoughts about non-Caucasian population genomes? Yeah, T to T. First of all, um, the one thing about T to T is that we then have to map it back to the reference coordinates because, unfortunately, for clinical diagnostics, we have to report on the HG thirty eight and the genes. Yeah. Which there is a tool for that. I think Florian has tested it, but mapping has new problems. It can introduce errors. But we had one case where we had in the telomere seemingly some. Uh, or close to the telomere, some duplication. And that one we could only perfectly map when we used T to T. Okay, so you are using it routinely. Yeah, we tried it, but okay. we are not right. in routine diagnostics, okay. um, be, simply because of the coordinates. Um, what was the second? Yeah, the second question was set up HX3. So that's a transcriptional repressor. Do you know what the repeat expansion does to the protein? Now, I haven't shown that here, but in our last repeat expansion, the repeat is also hypermethylated, but it's the last exon. And it seems like it doesn't change the expression. We checked it. Both alleles are expressed. We use long and short read RNA-seq. The expression doesn't seem to be affected. Uh, as soon as the paper is online, uh, I hope this week in Med Archive, you can look at all the wet lab stuff that the Utah lab did afterwards. So they looked at the aggregation uh, of that on the RNA and protein level, and these are details I'm not very good at. So, so, so the protein level, not very regulation. Yeah. So they did yeah. something. Okay, thanks a lot, Stefan. Um, your question we will postpone to the um, break, and we will continue with Helena. Um, there was a slight change in the program, so um, Helena has to be back in Berlin tomorrow when her students present. That's why we uh, moved her to the evening session. And since she won't be around tomorrow, ask all your questions today, right? So um, I will take any question. I won't um, stop anyone from asking. Thank you very much also for changing the program to give me the ability to present here today. Um, for a start, I would like to mention that um, this is a shared project with the Müller Group from the UKSH in uh, Kiel. And the two people that actually did all the work here are Brian Benville from UKSH, he is our wet lab magician, and Mara Steiger, um, who is in Berlin in my group. Okay, so. In contrast to like lots of the more inherited disorders, I would like to talk today about brain cancers. Um, brain cancers are quite difficult to diagnose and also um, to operate on later on. And that's where basically our project is uh, located. So brain cancers often present with diffuse system um, symptoms. So you can have a headache, you can have motor neural disorders and a variety of other things, which means usually it takes a little while before a patient actually goes to the doctor and complains basically about the symptoms. So the higher period of time between the symptoms and some disease treatment is actually quite long. So you have the symptoms, after which you then have some clinical examination, usually followed by imaging because of the location in the brain. It's hard sometimes, biopsies are taken, so it seems that this is rather a rare case. And usually then when it comes to the surgery, the operator actually does not really know which type of tumor is operated on, which means they kind of go blindly, more or less, into um, the surgery. And often a very critical information, which is if it actually metastasis from a different tumor, or is it a brain tumor on its own, is not known at that stage, but quite critical. And the recent WHO, actually updated also the classification of brain tumors, not only based on histopathology and stainings, but they also included molecular diagnosis. And this is a part where basically our project will um, take place on. So usually what happens is that after the surgery or even during the surgery, a piece of the tumor goes to histology and then the normal procedure, um, usually if you're lucky within the time of surgery happens, 
but everything else, which is based on the molecular diagnosis, takes way longer. So, for example, if 150K arrays to assess the methylation status of the tumor sample are taken, this is a procedure that takes minimum five to eight days to actually go through all the wet lab procedures. And during this time, it's, it's also quite hard for the actual patient mm -hmm. because they often don't know yet which type of tumor they suffered from, which is also some yeah, challenge, let's say, for the family as well as the patient themselves. And the aim of our project was to develop an interoperative um, predictor for brain tumor classes that is based on DNA methylation. And we have heard a lot about DNA methylation today, also how to detect it. But in addition to features like repeat expansion, hypo or hypermethylation and imprinting locus um, changes or um, effects, if you look at it in a quite global level, it actually has a quite fascinating feature, which means it is cell type specific. If you now look at our genome in general, at the very first moment, we have one fertilized oocyte, which has one single genome, it starts to divide. And within a few days, in months, or weeks in human, actually the very first lineage segregation happens and the first organ laid out. And during this time, the entire epigenome, specifically the DNA methylome, is really heavily rearranged. So that when we now look at our cells and would now sequence all of our cells here in the room, single cell, and would cluster them by the genomic information, we would rather cluster by individual, every genome, every single cell, uh, uh, rather than by I, cell type, which is the contrast for DNA methylation. If we would now cluster all these cells based on the DNA methylation information. We would rather have across all people mixed cell clusters, but they would be cell type specific. And that is a feature that we wanted to use um, for the brain tumor classification. And of course, we are not the first ones. So we heavily rely on a paper or a variety of papers that sequenced thousands and hundreds of brain tumors or looked at them mainly with 450K and epi, um, epic arrays. But that means it is a huge resource of DNA methylomes of different brain tumors. And the main hallmark paper here was published in Nature in 2018 by Kappa et al from the DKFZ. And what they did was they collected a variety of um, arrays that were published in their own making up of about 4,000 um, different samples consisting of uh, 91 tumor classes. And what they did was they clustered these based on the methylomes and found that actually these do really nicely cluster by different um, tumor types and that they could really nicely distinguish them. And they built at that point a random forest classifier on this, which showed that they can really nicely with high accuracy distinguish the different tumor types. And that is basically the resource that we build um, our, our project on. And I think it's also basically the basis for the current WHO's classification. So our aim was not only to be able to reproduce such a classifier and show that we can cluster also nanopore sequencing data, different tumor types, but in addition, we wanted to use the challenge to go from sample prep to prediction. And initially we said four hours, but then we decided to actually try to get below an hour. And therefore using the ability from nanopore sequencing, in this case, not actually long reads, but the ability to use the data while the sequencer is running. So basically once the read comes off the sequencer to do the base calling, the alignment and assess the methylation rates. And of course, if we wanted to stay below one hour in total, what we do is, in contrast to most of the people that look for really high coverage, we accepted that we are going to stay um, basically below 1x coverage. And that means we needed to develop, first of all, a wet lab um, workflow that was um, able to do all the library preparation and everything in 40, 45 minutes which means we have basically three chunks um, which each, each take 20 minutes. So we start from the gDNA extraction, which means we need to lyse and disrupt the tumor to the QC, then use the rapid kit library um, from Oxford Nanopore, load the library on the min ion, and then have about 20 to 15, 15 to 20 minutes for sequencing. And during this time then already start our predictions. And 
this is actually not the newest data. So this was based on um, one of the earlier base colors, but now we get way more CPGs covered within the amount of time, but the general feature stays. We have a more or less um, linear relationship between sequencing time of number of CPGs that we actually cover, which means currently with the newest algorithms, um, we obtain way more CPGs in the same amount of time. So we could reuse all the data that we had sequenced already and reproduced way better data, which means currently we get five to 8,000 CPGs within 50 minutes of sequencing. But you can see this linear relationship. So technically, if we would sequence longer, we would obtain more data. And yeah, as I said, our main problem here or aim here is to go for shallow sequencing and still use published whole genome, more or less data as good as possible for reference. So our classifier contains um, consists of basically two parts. The first part is based on these Illumina 450K arrays from the Kappa group. And we added some additional ones um, that were also published from Metastasis. And then utilize these methylation rates per CPG to actually train our model. And that means that since our model was trained on 450k data, because this is the greatest resource that is out there at the moment, also our prediction algorithm in the end can only use features that are based or placed on the 450k array. So what we then do is that we take our tumor sample, um, we start sequencing, and of course we don't get methylation rates that are as precise or as um, or precise probably yes we get on single reads, and um, we get methylation events, meaning we get binary information for every CPG, is it methylated or not, based on the one read that spans that CPG. And of course, our dropout rate is huge, meaning from all the 450k arrays that are technically possible that we train on, we get about 8,000 within these 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. So we needed to develop a model that is able to use these stochastic, because we don't know which CPGs we get, methylation events, combine them with the trained model on the 450K data, and then predict um, the tumor classes. And since there are a few challenges when training and then also doing the prediction on, front of, uh, on, on um, nanopore data, we decided to first do our benchmarking actually on 450K data. The main point here is that since it's 91 tumor classes that we would like to test to predict, that would mean we would need to sequence 91 tumor classes, preferentially in replicates from nanopore data. And since some of them are quite rare, we actually did not achieve that yet, but we're working on it. So our in-between working routine is that we used the 450K data and actually simulated shallow one read coverage data from these methylation rates, which means we assume the Bernoulli distribution to basically say, if we now just sequence one read per CPG, do I have a zero for unmethylated or one for methylated? And since usually when you do simulation, you don't wanna do stuff just once. We did this a hundred times. We also played with a thousand times. It does not change a lot. And then from these replicates, so for every 450K data sample that we had, we now had hundred simulated binary data sets we sampled one, two, five, and in the end also 10,000 CPGs randomly to simulate the effect of um, single reads that come from wherever in the genome. And then did our um, evaluations based on these data. And I know this is one of these rather large figures, but what you see is on the x-axis, we have the reference. So we have for these um, 91 tumor classes, basically one column, belongs to one tumor class. On the y-axis, we now have the prediction. So basically, a one-on-one -on -one assignment for every sample that we sequence or put into the um, benchmarking, what's the sample or the class that was predicted. And it's rather boring, which is good in this case, because if everything is on the diagonal, it means that we have a higher accuracy, so a high probability that whatever was defined as the correct tumor class for the array sample was also then um, predicted from our shallow coverage um, sequencing data. And this is based on the 8,000 CPGs that we get in approximately 15 minutes. You can see these uh, little squares. So we adjusted this the classes a little bit because after talking to a couple of surgeons and neuropathologists, they actually told us that nice it's nice to have 91 classes, 
but those that are clinically relevant seem to be a slightly lower number. So we group them based on these discussions into 42 clinically relevant classes, um, though you can see that in general, the predictions work quite well. One thing that I mentioned at the beginning is that most of the surgeons are actually not necessarily really interested in exactly which tumor class it is, but rather if we have a metastasis or actual um, CNS tumor. So what we did was expanding this model um, by using other 450K data that are published for um, breast, lung, and melanoma metastasis, and now asked if our algorithm can actually, after expanding the model, also predict these. And I think that's, yeah looks quite well. So given that we just asked for distinguishing these four classes with a quite high accuracy, we can now distinguish breast, lung, and melanoma classes from CNS tumors in general, which I think is also, given that all the classes work quite well, less surprising since it's really different cell types. So the methylome will really look different. And Let's say when we started, I think by now that changed a bit, but lots of people were quite skeptical that this could actually work in a clinical context. So what we tried to do is we created something we call a clinical demonstrator, which means that we went to the clinics, set our entire wet lab and dry lab up next to the OR, uh, and were nicely, uh, some surgeons allowed us to basically join their um, procedure and then directly obtain a sample in the OR and bring it into our wet lab to proceed once through the entire workflow. And as I said, this takes about an hour. So I have a little video for this. Let's see if it works, but we speed it a bit up to not make it take an hour. So you can see now Bjorn pipetting on the little tumor sample he got and he will start moving a bit quicker in a short amount of time. Um, so you can see how he initially starts to, to prep the sample. Um, and then now he starts moving a bit faster um, so that it takes about 15 to 20 minutes before he can start to, um, after extracting the DNA, to actually do the first QC steps, um, validate that he got good quality DNA, and then proceeds with the actual library preparation, um, sets up the mill ions, puts them up. You can see it's two of them because usually we try to work at least in replicates. Um, and then after about 40 minutes, once the minines are booted up, we can start getting the first reads of the sequencer and can start our predictions actually from the first very few CPGs that we sequence. And usually when we look at the predictions, what we see is that at the beginning, when we only have a few reads and a few hundred CPGs sequenced, our um, diagnosis or I think we can't our classification is quite diverse. So you can see also that the probability um, for a single class, which is the second column, basically starts at like 10, 20%, and then really starts to get up and still it's um, stabilizing at quite high levels. And usually during that time, also the probabilities for the other classes drop down. And yeah, just to basically sum this up, how this would look like when we um, try to visualize, not in a borrowing table, but rather into a dynamic graph system, what you can see is that we have multiple decision steps. First of all, okay, we have a, tum mm -hmm. uh, we have a sample, yes, but then is it a um, tumor tissue or normal tissue? Is it a surgical tumor or not? Glial or non-glial tumor and so on. So that we could stepwise um, build up this decision graph to relatively early decide on which type of action might be required. I have to say we are of course far away from having this actually featured into decisions during the um, operation. Um, but I think it's showcasing quite well what is possible with um, live sequencing um, or long read sequencing in general, reading out epigenetic information and potentially opening up at least the window of thinking about these as um, support during yeah, time intense or time critical decisions. Yeah, with this, I'm already at the end. Uh, I just want to mention that, of course, the two people I mentioned at the beginning are the most crucial ones that actually did all the work. However, there's a slightly larger team behind it. Um, and yeah, <laughs> of course, funding and yeah. thank you very much.
Yeah, thanks very much. I think you should send this video to Stephen Kingsmore, then he knows how much you lower the bar with uh, speedy diagnosis. So first question. Hi. Person, actually. So I, I think this is also important because the Illumina v chips are not CE certified yet and the FISTA tool can only be used for for research use only officially. Yes. Right. So this would be a yes. real pipeline. This is cool. Um, but, but I wonder whether the fast DNA isolation, does this interfere with the quality? Do, do, is, Huh. Is there a trade-off? Asking the computational. Um, <laughs> hard for me to say. As far as I can tell, um, of course, if you go for the slightly lower um, preparation, you have more motor proteins attached to the molecules, so your throughput is slightly higher. Though, so we played basically with waiting for longer versus starting sequencing earlier. What gives us if we stay within one hour in the like more after 15 minutes of sequencing. And that's basically how we slightly extended the, um, I think the time frame for giving it time to attach, but optimizing it with the output after about 15 minutes of sequencing. So I think if you have time, you will get a higher output, yes. Um, if it's timely constricted, constrained, it's I think a yeah, balancing act. Stefan? So how is low tumor content influencing the outcome of the model? Or I mean, there's other cells in there or then? Yeah, massively. Um, because what we do since we really have just one read um, per genomic region, um, low tumor content, of course, if the majority of reads come from normal, we will diagnose normal. So we have a variety of different normal tissues, including inflammatory and so on in there. Um, we also have a probability cut off below which we say, okay, this is just too shallow, it's unclear, and would rather not predict anything than, I mean, we hope to not predict anything rather than predicting something wrong. But yeah, um, low tumor content below 50% starts to get really tricky. We also have tumors from different sites, and you can really see prediction quality varying with the data quality. Okay. I had a very similar question. So can you infer tumor purity from the methylation level? Because that's a huge issue with GPM. So if you, the surgical resection, is that from, you know, pretty much normal? Huh, mm -hmm. So I would say it's a yes and no question. I think we can infer if it's high quality or low quality or high or low tumor purity. I think my, my wish dream would definitely to be to be able from a single read, assign it to a class and then say, okay, this is rather a normal read spanning or molecule coming from normal versus non-normal. I think at the moment, if we have the composite information, we can distinguish rather normal-ish from rather not normal. Um, I don't think it's quantitative from our data at least. Thanks. Um, one question. I mean, you all designed this to make it as fast as possible next to the operation signal, um, state. So you will work on fresh tissue. Um, any tests or included already in the models to do it from FFPE where you have definitely damage or a frozen and then rethought material, whether this influences your classification? So FFPE is definitely tricky. I think also the nanoprotein can comment on it. I think there's a variety of initiatives to try to optimize that. Um, we have tried, it's definitely the case that it's way harder. And since we are anyway already affected by lower quality being harder to distinguish, FP is nothing I would recommend at the moment. But I think there is a lot of initiatives that really try to make this possible just because of the huge amount of biobanks that now put, yeah, could, could be used. And I think it's an amazing resource that would be, could, could incredibly help with a lot of diseases. Okay, thanks a lot. Do we have online questions. Okay, then thanks again for making the trip. So we move on to the sponsor talk uh, from Pak Bio. And after that talk, we will do a little bio break before we continue with the keynote.
ich habe euch gesagt, nach dem Talk machen wir eine kurze Pause. Okay. Okay. Sehr gut. Ja. Wunderbar. Das ist hier im Weg. Okay, so. Uh, we had already previous speakers uh, highlighting the upsides of, of long reads, so thank you for that. That makes my life easier today. Uh, then I can be more brief on that. Um, so I will today uh, talk about recent advances and applications of PEGBIO with a special focus on rare and inherited disease. And as a disclaimer, so I will uh, mention some clinical applications of our technology, but uh, PEGBIO is research use only for now. Um, many will probably already be familiar how our technology works, so I will also be brief on this, but if you want to learn more, just come to our booth. Um, so our sequencing happens on the chips that we call smart cells, and there we have densely packed uh, tiny nanostructures called zero-mode waveguides. Um, and ideally, one circular library molecule goes into each of these zero-mode waveguides for sequencing. And they are illuminated from below so that we can detect the fluorescence there. And then we have a polymerase attached to the circular insert, which is incorporating these fluorescently labeled nucleotides so that we get these nice fluorescence graphs. And then we use deep learning models, which do the base calling from these graphs. And in order to achieve reads that are not only long, but also highly accurate, uh, we use a uh, circular consensus sequencing mode. And um, here we start uh, with a library molecule that is 15 to 20 KB. And um, we attach uh, bell-shaped adapters to both ends, uh, also a sequencing primer and a polymerase. And then as soon as this enters the zero mode waveguide, the polymerase enters um, the rolling circle amplification mode and generates a continuous long read of around 150 KB. And you see here these uh, tiny red dots. These are random sequencing errors. And by generating the consensus read from the multiple subreads of the insert, um, uh, we can polish out most of these sequencing errors. And then we have a read that is not only long, but also highly accurate. So more than 90% uh, is Q30 or higher. And um, yeah, this makes our technology one of the most, uh, or the most accurate sequences you can currently get uh, in the market, I would say. Um, and we have already heard of, of benefits of uh, long reads. Um, here I have a comparison between a short read genome and a hi-fi genome. So short reads are excellent as at SNVs and indels, but then there are other also important variant classes where, where short reads are struggling. And um, yeah, these are structural variants, tandem repeats. We have already heard a lot about those uh, segmental duplications, uh, dark regions of the genome where short reads don't map properly. And then from a hi-fi genome, you also get methylation and phasing. And I want now to, uh, yeah, bring some light into recent advances and applications. And first we look at structural variants. Oh, can you hear me good? I think I was a bit far from the microphone. Um, so structural variants are important. Here on the left, uh, you see um, how many uh, bases are affected by different uh, variant types. Maybe I should use my mouse. Um, and you can see that uh, with SN uh, SNPs and indels, uh, around five megabases are affected on average per individual. Uh, but for structural variants, this is more like 15 megabases. Uh, this is because, of course, each structural variance affects much more bases. And as a consequence, also 
um, around 50% of structural variants are pathogenic in ClinVa. And in the center, you can see um, a study from the Human Genome Structural Variation Consortium, uh, which um, was looking at 32 samples for which they uh, had short read data already available. Then they reanalyzed those samples um, with long reads. Um, and here they found with PecBio more than 2.5 times more structural variants. Again, highlighting how much we, we are missing here uh, with short reads. Then on the right, you see a recent case. This is from uh, Mitsugishi et al. in, in Japan. They had um, a 12-year-old uh, girl showing signs of intellectual disability. And she already had 10 years of inconclusive serial testing behind her. Even uh, whole exome sequencing was negative. Um, and then with PegBio, they found um, a 12 KB inversion that perfectly explained this case. And um, here's also a, a, a larger study. This is from uh, the Children's Mercy, Mercy Hospital in the US. They were looking at more than 1,000 uh, rare disease genomes. And they found, again, an, a similar increase in the number of uh, structural variants. And they also looked, how much does this increase the explanation rate? And, and they found that, yeah, this was increased by around 13%. So that's uh, really huge. And I also want to mention uh, that uh, the group at Children's Mercy, because they have looked at so many uh, genomes with, with HiFi um, and could really see the benefits that they get most of the results for which they currently need many other tests. I think this was also excellently highlighted already in the uh, ONT talk. And they are now moving towards uh, really using five-base HiFi sequencing as a first-line test in the clinical setting. I will also uh, talk more about this approach later. Um, next, let's look at tandem repeats. We also have heard about those a lot before, and they are also very important for human health and disease, especially because the mutation rate is so high in these tandem repeat regions, um, because it's inherently stable when you have these uh, long repeats. So the mutation rate is, is around 10 times higher and they are relevant for many diseases, especially neurological diseases like autism, epilepsy, and ALS. And so it's really important that um, we get the repeat count right, uh, that we identify medically relevant interruption sequences, and we, that we also get uh, the methylation state. And um, to unlock the full power of our technology for tandem repeats, we have developed uh, the tandem repeat genotyping tool or target. This was also already mentioned by Stefan before. Uh, here you see uh, briefly how it works. So it uses uh, aligned hi-fi reads and the user provided repeat definition as input. And then you can get a, a genome-wide tandem repeat catalog. And for each repeat, you get the, the flanking region, the repeat a motif, of course, the, the repeat count, and you also get uh, the methylation, and all of this is haplotype resolved, as, as you can see also. And uh, then you can also use the tandem repeat visualizer tool uh, to make nice plots, and we have also seen some of those already. Um, we have used uh, the target tool uh, in a study where we looked at um, 82 participants from um, the uh, 100,000 Genomes Project in the UK. And uh, in these uh, 82 participants, uh, we find nine pathogenic repeat expansions. Um, there were seven RFC1 expansions, then a mosaic fMR1 expansion, and also an ATXN8 expansion. Um, so five of these RFC1 expansions have already been verified, and from the, for the rest, this is still uh, ongoing. <clears throat> uh, next, uh, let us uh, look at segmental duplications, um, which are also very challenging uh, with short reads. And here we have also uh, developed a tool uh, called Paraphase, which works by um, extracting all the reads uh, that are relevant for the gene and the respective paralog or pseudogene. It then realigns that to uh, the gene of interest and it phases all the reads into uh, the different haplotypes so that you have it 
very nicely in, in one view. And then um, you can get a report where you get copy number of the functional gene, uh, disease or carrier status if applicable and other information. And also here, I want to share uh, one example. Uh, this is from the very challenging uh, region of SMN1 and SMN2. Again, we have also heard about this region before. They are involved in uh, spinal muscular atrophy, uh, which is a neurodegenerative disease and leading cause of infant death. And it is caused by a lack of functional SMN1. And then the copy number of SMN2 um, yeah, determines the severity of the disease. And these two genes are I think more than 99.9% .9 identical and also more than 30 KB long. So really a, a very challenging region. Um, but here you can see that the whole region is very nicely resolved. Uh, there's no major uh, uh, coverage dropout region across the whole uh, region. And in this case, uh, you see one haplotype of SMN2 has a larger deletion. So this uh, copy is not functional. But then the, the second haplotype of SMN2 is, is fully functional. Um, next, I also want to shed some light on, on methylation calling uh, with our technology. So uh, this works uh, because uh, same as with nanopore, we sequence native DNA that has not been amplified by PCR. So all the epigenetic modifications remain intact. Um, and whenever a nucleotide is methylated, this slows down our polymerase. So it, it modifies the kinetics of the polymerase. Um, and we use deep learning models, which uh, can yeah, translate that into methylation calls. And they come directly off the sequencer. So all these calculations are happening on the sequencer. Um, and here is, is one example from, from an imprinting disorder. This is from uh, Rady's Children's Hospital. So they had a, a patient showing signs of, of uh, prada willi syndrome. Um, and you see here the methylation in the NDN1 region. And you see that um, both haplotypes are highly methylated. Whereas when we look at the control individual, only one of the two haplotypes is methylated. The other one is not methylated, which is normal. So in, in this patient, um, both uh, chromosomes were inherited from uh, the mother. So both are methylated and inactive, leading to the pathologic effects. I also want to share a, a larger study on, on methylation. Um, this is a recent preprint, again, from uh, Children's Mercy, uh, the group of Tomi Pastinen. And they looked at uh, 276 uh, patients for which they had already pre-existing whole genome bisulfide data. And in general, they found very high concordance between the two technologies. Uh, but the big advantage of, of PEG bio hi fi is that you also get the phasing information. And this enabled them to make more uh, hypermethylation calls, uh, because often these are uh, haplotype specific. Um, and another advantage of the phasing is that they could uh, associate uh, other variants, especially in, in regulatory areas, to the hypermethylation events. And they hypothesize that um, such variants in regulatory regions can cause the hypermethylation, and thereby this would be a new um, uh, pathogenic disease mechanism. And uh, using that hypothesis, they were screening for such variants uh, in, in the non-coding uh, regions of the genome. And indeed, they found um, a previously overlooked uh, causative repeat expansion in the DIP2B gene, uh, which was causing a developmental delay in that patient. And so they could uh, solve this, this previously unsolved case. Um, so yeah, this is of course pure research for now. Um, but yeah, just imagine that um, the databases will further grow, uh, the tools will, will further evolve, and then it will be very useful to, to have these kinds of inf uh, yeah, information um, also for, for reanalysis of, um, of older samples when these new uh, uh, data become available.
Um, yeah, we, we have, uh, or I hope I could show that you could can really get a, a wide breadth of, of information with, with the HIFI genome. Um, for, and to otherwise get this information, you really need uh, multiple tests. And um, that is why some pioneers of, of uh, uh, clients using our technology are already considering to, to use a HIFI genome as a first line test. I already mentioned uh, Children's Mercy, which are already starting to implement that um, because uh, often you have a large uh, or a long odyssey of, of doing genetic tests. I will not repeat that here. We had that in the, in the Nanopore talk already. And yeah, some in the end, still after all these tests, uh, do a HIFI genome because there's still some information you, you don't get from any of the other tests. Um, and then it can really make sense going uh, directly to, to long reads. And um, then, of course, the, you get all these results much faster and uh, all the equipment for, for the other tests uh, might not be have to be maintained anymore. And also from a cost perspective, then um, a HIFI genome doesn't look so expensive anymore. Uh, we are with our new review high throughput sequencer. We are at roughly 1,130 uh, euro at list price per whole genome. Um, one problem that still exists with our technology is you sometimes find, or you often actually find variants that are not found with any other technology, and then these variants are not in the databases. And then you cannot say if this variant is pathogenic or not, because you don't have any frequency data. And that is why we have brought the Consortium for Long Read Sequencing database uh, to life, where we are uh, building up these databases. So probably this number is already outdated, um, but we have more than 2,000 genomes from, from nine different investigators and, and growing. Uh, to really give you these frequency data and um, achieve something that is like a GNOMAT light for long reads. And this comes with a standardized bioinformatic pipeline that we can now offer, which includes all the variant calling tools. So it includes uh, things like target or paraphrase that I have mentioned. Um, and you get a single VCF file with all the variant calls from a HiFi genome, and that is completely automated and can then be used for downstream tertiary analysis tools. Um, yeah, continuing on that theme, we really want to provide an end-to-end uh, -end streamlined workflow. And in order to achieve that, we have uh, partnered with other companies. On the one hand, on the... Um, Upstream sample prep side, we have uh, partnered with uh, automation companies like uh, Hamilton, uh, TCAN, and, and others to have ready to use protocols for automation and have our uh, library prep kits compatible with their systems. And then on the other end, on the data analysis side, uh, we have also made great progress in, in the recent year to partner with um, software providers like uh, Golden Helix, GeneX, and others. Um, uh, so that our data output is directly compatible with their softwares and you have a very uh, streamlined experience. <clears throat> I want to highlight um, another recent preprint. This is um, from the group of Andrew Stegaches at the University of Washington. And what they achieved is uh, a truly multi-omic approach from a single smart cell. Um, uh, so what you get anywhere with our technology is the genome and the methylome. But here they also achieved um, to get the, the chromatin epigenome and the transcriptome from a single smart cell. And uh, how they achieved that was two modifications to uh, the library prep process. One is they did um, a fiber seq reaction. Here the genomic DNA is treated with um, a methyl transferase, which is labeling um, nucleotides that are openly accessible with the 6MA. So everything that is not occupied by nucleosomes or by transcription factors is labeled. And later using our methylation calling ability, um, this, this can be then translated into this information. Uh, yeah, which parts of the uh, genome were openly accessible. And then the other one was 
They were also preparing cDNA and then using our new MarSeq approach to concatenate the cDNA into a longer chain, which has the optimal length for our technology, uh, so around 15 to 20 kb. On the one hand, then you get much more reads, but the other is you have the same library length as the genomic DNA, so you can throw all of that together on one smart cell. They mixed it uh, 15 to one parts, and uh, then they also got uh, the transcriptome. And here you see uh, the two haplotypes. So you have for the first haplotype, the genome, the methylome, chromatin epigenome, and then also the transcripts. And uh, same for the second haplotype. And then we, they were using that information to look at uh, patients from the undiagnosed disease network. And I will not uh, go into detail here for, for time reasons, but you can uh, well see that all parts of the four ohms were really used to elucidate uh, uh, yeah, pathogenic uh, symptoms of the patient. And you can also see the interactions between the different ohms. So this is a pretty exciting preprint. If, if you want to learn more, I can really recommend that. Um, and then I just mentioned, and this is my uh, last two sli slides, then we, we can open for questions. Um, I just mentioned our new MASIC approach. Uh, so here we are uh, concatenating uh, cDNAs uh, to to get to use the full um, uh, sequencing length of our technology and not waste any sequencing capacity. And we already had that available for single cell uh, RNA sequencing. And now in in the next few weeks we will re release that for bulk RNA, um, and that will be an eightfold throughput increase. And here is uh, a data set we have generated with that. Uh, so this is a single Revio smart cell where you get around uh, 40 million reads. And of course, with long reads, you really get the full um, isoforms. This is also something we heard already in a pre previous talk. Uh, here you see the read length distribution. So you also get the longer isoforms. And uh, here you can see that at around 10 million reads, uh, it, it's, you have a saturation effect of, of finding new isoforms. So you can also, also multiplex multiple samples. Um, and also with our new high throughput review, this really gives you also quantitative information that you don't have to supplement with short reads. Um, yeah, with that, uh, I'm, I'm through my presentation and, and uh, open for questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Felix. And the first question. Thanks. What's the precision of the DNA methylation values on single CPGs as compared to whole genome biosphere sequencing? Yeah, so uh, the the concordance is is very high. I think precision is is difficult to tell uh, because you need some sort of of ground truth uh, for that. So I, I don't have uh, exact precision values for that. Uh, are they available for other technologies? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the it's definitely above ninety percent concordance. That's uh, but I can I can look that up. Also. Yeah. yeah. Do we have more questions online? Maybe. Okay, then thanks again. Uh, I think all of us really appreciate that there's now again competition between. Um, on ONT and PacBio, so that's a fair game again. Apropos game, don't forget about the game night, and <laughs> we all we all expect um, ONT to compete with PacBio also in the games we set up for you. Okay, and uh, now a question.